Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from Fishers, Indiana, in the United States. He is the president of Gap Integrity, highly experienced CRM, XRM, Dataverse, Power Apps, Power Platform developer, as well as, of course, a traditional .NET developer. He is frequently speaking at events, training conferences worldwide. Uh, year long, he's a co-host of the XRM Toolcast podcast. Check out the show notes for links to these, as well as his social media, bio, etc., Welcome to the show, Daryl. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be on. Good to have you on, mate. It's been a long time since you've been on. The last show that you were on with me was episode 121. I'm about to hit episode while I'm getting into close to the 600s um, of episodes. So as you can imagine, that was a very long time ago. I was a green podcaster. It was. I was just a babe. So new. So new to it then. Just to give us a bit of background before we get cranking. Food, family, fun. What do they mean to you? So family is number one there. My wife and three kids, uh, they keep me busy, uh, keep me energized. And um, I'm entering the teenage years now with um, uh, my son will be 13 this year. My daughter's going to be 15 uh, next month here. So uh, I'm actually heading out to Colorado uh, with my son, my, my middle son. Um, and uh, we're going to go do like a um, kind of like a manhood trip. We're going to uh, climb Pikes Peak, which is uh, 14,000 feet divide that by three for those that are in meters, but um, it's way above the tree line. So it'll be very challenging from an oxygen uh, standpoint because I'm at like nice. 600 meters currently. So um, yeah, it'll be, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm at like 200 meters currently. Yeah. yeah um, so yeah. yes, it'll be completely different for me. So yes. Wicked. And was it a weekend long trip type thing planned? Yes. Yep. Yep. We leave on Thursday and get back on, uh, uh, actually we'll get back on two, I don't know, late Monday, late Monday, okay. but, um, nice. yep. Gonna kind of go through and explain things that are involved with, uh, coming of age. So yes, be an exciting trip. I love it. Awesome, man. Awesome. So give us a bit of background of what you were doing before you came across the power platform. Uh, actually before you came across dynamics, right? Cause for those of you in the know, dataverse, is the the abstracted layer of what we had with Dynamics CRM back in the day that basically gave us a headless tool to build any type of solution. So take us back to before your CRM days with Dynamics. Let's go back that far to start with. Yeah. So before my CRM days, I was working at a uh, local nationwide retailer, kind of like a Best Buy. They've since gone on a business, but I was working at the headquarters. I was in uh, ASP.NET, Web Forms, uh, C Sharp back in the day, and just doing basic generic Microsoft development on custom app dev stuff. So and that was my day in, day out. And most of the stuff I did was internal. Some stuff I did was publicly facing, like, you know, trying to figure out, go query our backend databases and figure out where we're, uh, where our stock, where we're at stores. So that way we could figure out, if, you know, what store near you has this particular product and that kind of stuff. So um, I did that, but then a lot of internal stuff as well. So, yeah. And then how did Dynamics come on the, the play? Like, how did that come on your developer journey? At what point was it? And uh, yeah, for you. Yeah. So I, did, I didn't get into Dynamics willingly, I guess. It wasn't like my goal. I was like, I'm not going to, like, yes, this sounds great. Uh, it's going to yeah. be awesome. Um, it, as, most devs are like, I don't want to be in this box. I want to be able to just do whatever the latest and greatest stuff and do whatever new stuff is. I don't want to be um, in this box. And so that was, I, I guess, me at the time as well. Um, and so what happened was I uh, had a consultant firm reached out and was like, hey, would you be interested in joining us? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Let me go ask my friend. I actually used to work there. And he's like, um, that place is okay, but the place I'm at now is hiring. I think that's even better. So why don't you go talk to us? And I was like, okay. Um, and he used to be doing the same thing, basically thing I was. And then he got into leading the dynamics practice in the technical sense uh, mm -hmm. at the consulting firm. So I was like, okay, I'll join. Um, I was just joining as a regular .NET dev, not dynamics at all. And then um, they said, hey, our first project that we need you on is actually in dynamics. Would you be willing to pick that up? And I was like, well that probably increased the likelihood of me working with my friends. So sure, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. Can't be that hard. And um, it was, I think, probably two months into the project where I realized, oh, I know more about this than anybody else in the company does because it wasn't really their main source of income. So it was like me and maybe two other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had, you know, a hundred some odd 
custom app dev people on uh, the company. So uh, yeah, that was kind of interesting to, to quickly get caught up on that and to, to learn everything. So yeah, nice. that's how I got brought into it. My last background question for you is this. Why did you stay with it? Why didn't you just continue your .NET C Sharp career yeah. and build apps um, based on that skill set? What was the kind of, oh my gosh, why the Power Platform that we have today, of course, whatever it was before? So one of the parts I don't like about being a developer is having to learn a whole bunch of brand new stuff all at once because it's kind of like a paralyzing effect of I, there's 50,000 things. I don't know how to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, so that's one one thing is on the platform, at least it's the platform, once I learned the basics of that, you know, they're constantly changing things, but it's not nearly as much of a shift as what you would have just in regular custom app dev. Or, okay, this new framework coming out, it's completely different. Oh, this new language is coming out, it's completely different. And, and or this new database technology or this new whatever service is coming out, it's completely different. Um, so everything is, you know, a lot of the stuff is still the same for 2011 tech-wise at the basic level. Like you can still do the same basic things. And that, that has to change. So that's one, one good thing. The other good thing is I am not a pretty dev. I do not make things pretty. I make them functional. They work. Um, but as far as like publicly facing, oh, this is amazing. I want to use it. Uh, that's not me. I, I let the, the people that are the, the pretty CSS people of the world go through and do that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so I don't, that was one thing I didn't have to learn. And I was very glad on the platform. But I didn't have to go through and create all the GUI stuff for it. I just defined the data and it gave me a GUI without me having to do anything. So that made my life simpler in that aspect, much simpler. I appreciated that. That's my reason to stay with it. Nice. You, you said you didn't. You don't want to be constrained. Most developers don't want to be constrained. Yeah. Um, or put in a box as such. So let's talk about that. What is the um, the limitations of the Power Platform from a uh, a developer's perspective? So the funny part is after being on the platform for a while, and especially as the platforms evolved, those limitations are becoming farther and farther in between. Yes, there are some core aspects that you have to know still how to do if you're going to really understand the breadth of it. But so much stuff is just in Azure and Azure Functions and Databricks and, and all this other stuff that's not even on the actual platform itself that you're you're still playing with basically any Microsoft technology you want to. You know, back in the day, we were going to the MVP Summit and them talking about dynamics, you know, the, the top speaker talking about dynamics, we were lucky if we got a footnote in the topic, you know, an hour long session. And now, now we're going, it's like, 80% of the talk is about the power platform, this the power platform, that, and all this other kind of stuff. So it's, it's interesting how we've gone from, from being the, um, the crazy uncle of the family that no one wants to talk about to kind of being the centerpiece. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's been interesting as, as well to watch that. So yes, the, the old me didn't realize that, uh, the, once you get on the platform that really there's a lot of stuff that you still get to play with and have fun with. In fact, I even had an interview with a guy once. He's like, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't, you know, there's other things I want to work with. I was like, you can work with basically everything that you're working with now. You just, you just don't have to worry about some other stuff. It just takes the other stuff off your plate so you can focus on what you want to focus on. So, yeah. So that's interesting. So you're saying you're not constrained just by the Power Platform. You've still got everything that's in Azure at your beck and call to, to extend into and everything in M365 to extend into or consume if it's already built there and you 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 have a use case. And I think of Intra ID as one of those. You don't have to worry about it. It's, it's taken care of and therefore consumable. Yep. Tell me this then, back in the day, and I'm talking about the on-premise days when we used to deploy, you know, m multiple servers and things like that. I remember being on a project and it was for a, a government agency and the government agency had already implemented, it was a failed implementation of back then of the Dynamics product. And the reason it was a failed implementation is that um, the company that did the work had no experience with Dynamics but they had a whole team of .NET developers and they said, how hard can this be? It's SQL underlying, you know, integration with some peripheral services like, you know, reporting services and exchange and things like that. And it's .NET. Hey, we can build it. And, and the biggest issue was it was a global deployment. So New York, London, uh, and a multiple of other countries because it's been a government agency that had international, you know, um, presence. And, they had basically screwed it over because they didn't listen or obey anything in back then the software development kit, right, which says that you cannot do SQL injections as an example um, and a number of other things. And the thing was just running like an absolute dog. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and back then it was like, well, throw some more RAM in it, get 
faster discs. That's the issue. And of course, it had nothing to do with that. When you say you can do anything, I go back to my question, are there any constraints um, on the power platform? So um, I'll give you an example. So on the recent project I was on, I've integrated, I think, with collect.com, box.com, a couple internal application integrations, and like one other thing as well. And when you're dealing with integrations, like it doesn't matter. You're one thing's talking to another thing. It's all JSON anyway. So, I mean, it's not like it's, there, there's any real big issue to deal with there. Um, so then on the actual platform itself, their constraints mostly would be actually on the UI side of the fence. If there's any like custom UI stuff you want to use, you're going to be rather kind of uh, constrained to what you want to do outside of like iframing and some stuff or that kind of stuff is going to be uh, more painful. So really the one point that I'm going to say, yes, you do want to be careful of is if you are trying to make something that's amazingly pretty or amazingly specific and customizable is you kind of have to take your hands off of it and say, hey, this is not designed to be the exact pretty, you know, pixel perfect, you know, the canvas apps will get closer to that. Um, but even with that, there are some things that it just, it's kind of difficult to do in that, that the, the custom dev stack would be able to give you more features on. But what it's going to help you on is that price point and that in making it available for other people to use and just to bring it to market faster. There's so many other reasons that it's acceptable in the vast majority of cases to, to say, you know what, I can sacrifice on this to get that. You're always going to have trade-offs in whatever you're doing. Yeah. So what about um, performance limitations? You know, Dataverse ultimately is accessed via an API, whether that's a power app, power automate, or anything else. Yes. Uh, potential bottleneck, right? Is that That's what would jump to mind for me. You know, what if I want to do a massive data load, 10 terabytes of data or something crazy? Yeah. What's my performance limitations? Let's take a quick break. Are you ready to transform your career in just 90 days? Join me on the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge and unlock your full potential. As a listen to the podcast, enroll now and get 10% off using the code MBAP. That's MBAP at the checkout. Don't miss this opportunity to learn from industry leaders and accelerate your growth. Visit ako.nz365guy.com and start your journey today. So unfortunately, that's the thing that it's very difficult to to get a, a good answer on because every single time, every integration you've ever been in that's large like that is just completely its own its own beast, its own thing. Um, I will say that I've been amazed in the you know three or four years here at how much the improvements that you the rarity I've seen that the Dataverse has actually been the performance bottleneck. As long as you are utilizing the correct methods that they offer in order to do those massive type of integrations. The biggest issue really isn't performance as much as it is cost for storage, I think. Um, Because at some point in time, if you're dealing with massive cost for storage, is now if you're not you know, utilizing virtual tables or or some other things, you're going to potentially run into issues where, all right, this thing's massive and we're paying a lot of extra money. We wouldn't, you know, it still works, but it isn't uh, probably economical or isn't the wisest choice going when you're dealing with those massive quantities of data. So once you get into those massive areas, uh, you're going to be spending a lot more money per per project than you would otherwise. So there is a, a upper level that is maybe kind of um, dangerous, I would say, mm-hmm. but I would say that you're dealing with 1% of companies, if not less. Yeah, yeah. A tenth of a percent probably of companies dealing with that. I mean, I know Best Buy um, tended to run a whole bunch of stuff on their CRM instance. So if Best Buy can run it, most other people can run it as well. Yeah, nice. Tell me about integration challenges. Are there any? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, but <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean it's not. It's mostly on the other side. It's, uh, I feel like it's mostly on the other side. What do you What do you mean? Well, I'm saying um, another thing's trying to talk or other things getting the data the, the correct way. I guess you might say. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was on a, a project. The project that failed mightily more than any of the projects I ever had that have failed. Um, it was, uh, I was working with a consulting firm. They brought in someone to do an integration from this existing backend. Um, and they were doing some really custom Azure um, Azure database that they were going through to, to grab all this data. And it was just failing massively. And everything on the CRM integration was working just perfectly fine, but they just couldn't get the data. They couldn't get it in the right format. It was always changing. It wasn't under. You couldn't parse it. You couldn't. It, it was. It was incredible how that was. Um, that was kind of the issue. So, um, but outside of that, no. I, it's 
it's, I haven't really had any other issues and it's been mostly on the non, it's been on the other side coming in rather than, um, on the CRM side itself on the, I keep on saying CRM, the dataverse side, yeah, yeah. the power platform side itself. So that's, that's been rarely the issue. There are some hoops sometimes you need to jump through. Oh, well, it's doing this and you have to do it this way. Um, or you have to do it this way or, Hey, we're running some plugins, and that's going to be a two minute timeout. So you have to make sure that you're going to be able to execute it less than that of, oh, well, if you do that, then maybe you just need to turn off the plugins and it'll go faster. So there's lots of um, maybe some hoops that you have to go through, mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. scars that you may get from it. But it's there's um, having that proverbial cliff of, oh, no, we've gotten halfway down this and now we're stuck. I've yet to run into that uh, yet. Nice. You touched on cost before, potential mm-hmm. storage costs. How does one control storage? in such a way, like whether it's an archiving strategy and is there such one with um, with Dataverse? And if you're saying storage is your potential cost issue, and I see people potentially would jump to mind, well, I, I would do that in a low-cost storage environment, where, whether it be Blob, whether it's Cosmos DB or something else. But with Dataverse, you don't have that necessarily in what you get out of that box, that flexibility to go, I want this data set to be over there. How do you handle with your customers, one, good cleanup routines, and two, making sure that the data is in the uh, price-optimized storage environment at any time. (laughs) Um, I don't know how your projects are run. My projects tend to be run on the, we're already two months late, Here's your name. Here's your here's your user ID. Here's your password. Uh, get crack a lacking. So I haven't spent a whole lot of time on the phase of preparing to avoid that problem. Mm-hmm. So usually, oh, we get an email. Hey, we've we've met the storage limit. Good thing is that you don't. It just because you meet the storage limit doesn't mean anything really from a usability standpoint. There's certain things in the back end you can't do, but the actual production system will run just fine. Um, <laughs> one client I was on, I think they had, I think they were over the data limit for like massively, like ten times over the data limit wow. for like the last three years it was kind of ridiculous but uh under those 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 um lines it's it's like okay what's going on what's what's causing the issue and oh well for this case for this one particular client each one's different this one they deal with uh ticketing systems so they're actually selling tickets for concerts Mm -hmm. and oh every single time they had an event there was some back-end process that was going through and incrementing the number of people at the event so if they had sixty thousand people that bought tickets it would increment that number 60,000 times. And, oh, that's being backed up in their data store and their um, their uh, tracking history. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, oh, that's filling up the tracking table. And it's like, oh, we'll just turn that off and delete those records that have been existed because who cares what it went from one to two to three to four to 60,000? Yeah. You don't need that. And so it's, it's a lot of that stuff is the full speed ahead until you say, oh, okay, here's an issue. And then you quickly figure it out, try, try agit, and then you're, you resolve it and move on to the next fire that you're putting out. So that's, that's been my experience. Not that that's what I prefer to do, but it, it tends to work just fine. And, and um, yeah, it, it, you don't ever get to the point where like, oh, we're, we've lost, we're done. Can't do it anymore. Um, there are some times where, okay, if we, we really should have done this with a virtual table so mm-hmm, we have something mm-hmm. else that's backing it. Or, oh, hey, we really should, shouldn't be bringing all this data in. Um, okay, hey, we're, we have too much data in here. We need to go through it and actually start deleting some of this data or backing it up to another system. Um, and so you have to go through and, and do that. But each client is just so unique that it's um, kind of difficult to do that. But the great thing about it being on a platform at the same time is there are a lot of tools already out there to help you with that because it's all universal it's all um standardized it's kind of it's almost like the you know in star trek where you have this other crazy thing comes in and it just knows your data and starts communicating and extracting it out like that doesn't you don't get that custom app dev it's like oh what database provider are you using what's your data layer using what's the what's your security profile like you have all these other questions you have to figure out and work with and that may or may not be compatible um we're in if you're on the platform, yeah. you have a whole system of things that's already built and ready to plug in. Um, and most of the times it's just, you know, signing a few, putting a few swipes of the credit card and then there you go, ready to go. And and you've saved money because it would take you far longer to do it yourself. And you save time because you fixed the problem in a matter of you know, days or hours, depending on what it is potentially, um, and, and move forward with actual problems that are actually, <laughs> that your business can actually work on rather than technical issues. Mm. What about Security, and I'm not talking about security from a you know could we do a pen test or anything like that, like on Microsoft server environments, but security when it comes to writing robust code that is uh, secure by nature. 
So whether, you know, uh, things that jump to mind for me are encryption, are, uh, you know, not storing in clear text stuff that shouldn't be, you know, that, yeah. and the robustness, you know, that you get in a, uh, a .NET world around making sure that what needs to be secured is secured. What are the limitations of the Power Platform Dataverse? I don't know if I'd say limitations, but they're just the, the, you need to make sure that if you're going to be architecting something along those lines, that you understand the features that are available to you and understanding um, all the options that you have. Because <laughs> there are really a ton of different things you can think about doing. Things from virtual VPNs that you can do within Microsoft Networks. Mm-hmm. You can do things with field level security. You could do things with I don't know, whatever other things you're thinking of. And then the good news is that the actual majority of developers are going to be writing plugins, which are all internal. And so you don't really have to worry about yeah. security in that as long as you're not speaking out to something else or sending data out somewhere else. That's all self-contained. And, and by nature, you can't do anything to interact with somebody else's stuff. You're, mm-hmm. you're in your own mm-hmm. sandbox. It's your sandbox. Congratulations. Shoot yourself the foot you want to, but it's your own gun, your own foot. You're not going to shoot somebody else's uh, foot and they're not going to shoot your foot. So yeah, so those things are things that I you really just need to know what's available. And is that limited to you? Maybe, I don't know, because I haven't had to worry about it. Yeah. Custom dev word, you have to know about so much stuff. And, and man, I can't imagine how long it would take to figure out, okay, what's the best option for security in this aspect? How do I make sure mm-hmm. this is rapidly handled in this way or shape or form where, hey, the security model is already in place. Microsoft's got a ton of people that are already working on it for you. Congratulations. You can focus on something that actually is going to bring value to your customer rather than making sure that no one else can go in and, and edit it, which oh. is such a far cry from back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My first job, They had like 10 gigabytes worth of access databases of these realtors that contained every, all their, all the personal information, their social security numbers, their probably even the credit, maybe not the credit cards, but their addresses, their, their birth, dates of birth, everything on a public network drive that like you can just walk in with a USB and and grab everything and walk out. Um, So hackers have gotten better, which is bad, but at the same point in time, security has gotten a lot better too. So yeah. um, yeah. (laughs) What's the learning curve? As in, if to one, pick up Dataverse, the power platform, and the suite of products there, an experienced coder, what's their, like, yeah, I know I'm not asking for how long is a piece of string, but like what's involved in learning enough to be able to start putting these tools to, uh, you know, in, in as part of your project? Yeah. So I'll focus on just internal stuff rather than integration type of work yeah. um, because that's going to be completely brand new to somebody, right? Um, so if you're bringing somebody that's coming in, if they are already a .NET developer, then they're 90% of their way there already as far as doing backend server plugin development. It's, all right, here's my interface. Here's a the early bond generator. If you want to go through and generate your types, you have a telesense everything and compile time to check safety. And all right, so that's good. And then, oh, um, if you want to deal with the client side, then that's a different question as well. Okay, so do you, you know, have some TypeScript abilities or JavaScript abilities? Those are pretty universal for anyone that's in the Microsoft stack. And so, all right, well, this is where your entry point is for this. And this is how you can interact. Here's the data model for this. Here's the documentation for that. And, and so uh, a lot of that stuff you can find on your own. AI has made that even easier now. So you don't necessarily need uh, someone else to bring you up with it. But I've been on multiple projects where I've had people that are just strictly no no experience at all with the platform. And within probably a day and a half of, of being with them, walking mm-hmm, through a couple mm-hmm. of examples, they're fairly productive. And within a couple of weeks, then they're they're fairly, very productive, I would say. Um, I've been, <laughs> I deal with a lot of developers that are um, offshore and, and maybe they're, uh, you know, the last project I was on, I think there was like three months of development total. And um it was a couple of frustrating moments um, until finally they got to the point of, hey, I've been doing this for over a decade, which is probably a little bit under half of their, their age. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So there's got to be more that I know. And it's okay for you to say, I don't know this. And then we can talk through that. And so once we got through that little coming to Jesus moment, like this guy turned into one of our best devs. Yeah. And I mean, he'd only had three months of devs under his work, under his three months mm-hmm. of dev under mm-hmm. his belt, and then probably a couple of weeks to three weeks of just, hey, going through and, and, and kind of some one-on-one time here and there. And he was off the, off the races, ready to go. So, um, so yeah, is it easy to pick up? Yes, it's easy to pick up, um, especially since there's so much stuff that's out there. There's so many um, people that are out there. Like, if you go from one company to another company, you have to learn everything about their custom solution. 
everything because it's not guaranteed to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. When you're going from one power platform shop to another power platform shop, you don't have to learn everything. You only have to learn how they implemented it, what are they using out of it, and you don't have to learn the, the under underlying technology. So not only is it easy to pick up, once you've picked it up, now you're applicable and employable for yourself, if you're thinking about yourself, uh, t- for other companies that are in that same that same bucket. So it, it's a, a wonderful um, a business opportunity for someone to, to add that to the skill set, because now, hey, there's all these other options that people are much more willing to, to look at me for if I've got just a little bit of experience, because really, you could be quite productive with very minimal practice at it, really. Nice. So let's say I get pulled in on a project and, or let's say I go for a job that they've said, you know, it's going to involve the power platform. I've never been on a, an enterprise or a large power platform project where full backend development hasn't been part of that story, right? Because you can do so much, yes, around, you know, through the UI, creating your tables, your columns, et cetera. Um, and there's a there's a lot that can be done. We see a lot of functional based consultants, non developers, um, dare we say, low code developers, um, building out applications. I want to put that to one side. As a professional developer, please don't shoot me if you classify low code as professional development. I don't mean you. I mean the audience, because uh, I know it does. Don't I'm not worried about the nuance. Um, as a pro developer, let's, let's say as as a .NET developer, give me the kind of top five things that you would typically do if you're part of professional development team um, for the Power Platform. So you might be working, let's say, for a Microsoft partner and all they do are Power Platform implementations. If I was a dev, in other words, I open Visual Studio and and I'd use things like GitHub and uh, pipelines and ALM and uh, all those great things, what if I was to define them into categories, what are my typical things that I would do and build as part of a project like this? Okay. So you're going to be, uh, let's see here. So if I think of the server side of the, the fence, it'll be building plugins, plugins C-sharp projects. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll be hopefully unit testing those things, <laughs> um, especially I, I find a lot of people are new to development entirely. And so they kind of skip the unit testing part of it. But anyone that's got previous experience comes in to like, why aren't they using unit testing? There's lots of tools that are available for that to make your life easier on that side of the fence. Um, there's going to be uh, maybe a little bit of a difference in that you're having to deploy your code to a server after you've unit tested it rather than maybe running it locally because um, that's a, a little bit different in that aspect. Um, so you're going to be working with that. You're going to be working with um, getting your changes into a managed or into a solution which is something that completely different uh it would be unique something that would be um mm-hmm. you have to learn now it's not difficult uh it's just you have to learn it um and it's just okay this is how i get my changes in this is how i get my plugin in this is how i register the changes for it and so the system knows when to call it what information to give it what's the context to give it um and that kind of information so there's that work that would be involved and then generally depending on the size of the team um, you're also going to be doing some of the configuration of the system as well, which is always kind of interesting where that line falls. Mm-hmm. I've been on some teams where they've got BAs that are doing everything. They're creating every field for you. Mm-hmm. They're, creating, mm-hmm. they're creating the forms for you. They're creating the views. They're doing everything. And then I've got other teams where it's a little mix match. You do a little bit of that. They do a little bit of this. And others where the devs are doing everything. And so uh, so depending on that team size, uh, you may be involved with, okay, doing some of the configuration work just to get the data bottle uh, set up correctly, assuming you're doing a, a model drip map mm-hmm. um, for that. So that's kind of some things you'd be doing. I mean, you'd be doing with with uh, GitHub, uh, pr- unless or whatever whatever um, source control you're using. Yeah. Um, GitHub, Team Foundation Server, whatever DevOps, uh, whatever pipeline is set up for that. Um, although there is some automatic pipeline that's not available on the platform, um, but generally, if you're on a bigger uh, dev project like that, they'll run into some custom reason that they'll need to have their own custom um, ALM solution. So you have that part in there as well. Sometimes you can get into some fun UI testing as well. Um, that's that's a little bit more rare, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, automated UI testing, but it, it is there's something that that's available for that. So, yeah. So that would be on the plugin side, and you could do a lot of the same things on the on the front end side as well. You can do unit testing. You can do um, still the pipeline process, getting your your changes merged in, um, and, and all that kind of fun stuff. So I would say maybe one thing that would be different there is that getting your changes in, depending on how the ALM works, 
is it could just be set up so that you're just committing your, your code directly to source control and everything builds off of that. Could be that they are merging it directly into a, a, a dev gold environment of some sort. So you have to be careful about your changes not over- overriding somebody else's changes or vice versa. Not that you can't recover from it, but um, you do, oh, uh, well, my change was in here and someone else changed it. So let me push my change back again. So, so that is one one area that you have to be a little bit care- careful of. It can be done rather poorly and affect the team, um, but it's not a requirement. It isn't, mm-hmm. a, a, this is, you know, back in the day, um, DLL hell trying to figure out, you know, what is, it, it's not that type of problem where it's a, a horrible problem no matter what happens. It's It can be a bad problem if you don't spend the time to get rid of the bad problem, I guess you could say. So Yeah. What about PCF? PCF is an area that I have barely, barely touched. Wow. I want to get more into it. I just haven't been on a project where, oh yeah, we need all this uh, custom UI stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I've done Canvas apps quite a bit, mm-hmm. um, far more than I've done PCF. And so I, I've i just tweaked a few PCF controls. Andrew Botenko's, uh like gallery or uh, address control, I think I did some tweaking on that and, and submitted some change uh, pull requests for that. So I've done a few, few of those things, but those are not, from scratch. Yeah. Um, so every now and then I touch it, but it's very rare. So I'm not an expert in the PCF style. Outside of saying, there are a whole lot of features available on the PCF gallery. So feel free to check those out. But yes. My last question, how Visual Studio friendly is the Power Platform? So it's gotten a lot better recently. And I'll say that, that uh, I guess, I don't know, back in like 20, 2015 and before, they were trying to get plugins directly into Visual Studio for doing a lot of this kind of fancy work Mm -hmm. um, and extensions for that. And they always seem to be lagging behind. But then once we started getting the full like power platform like team together, I think they got the resources to be able to kind of keep up on that. Um, They've been doing a lot more work now and I suggested it whether or not I was, they were the ones to actually take my suggestion or they were already doing that and I was just confirming it. But I was like, hey, you guys need to be doing more work on just command line stuff. Mm-hmm. And the work they've been doing in the, the Power Apps command line, the PACU, uh, CLI, mm-hmm. same thing. But um, yep. the, the the work they've been doing that is impressive and how what allows you to do. And so recently, just this week, actually, I posted a, hey, if you just want to automatically you know, select a, you know, rather than building in release or in dev, if you want to build in um, a deploy mode and have automatically deployed to your local dev, here's the steps to do it. And... It's using the pack util under the covers, and it's all driven through. So exe to increase the um, the assembly version, but outside of that, it's all just built straight into Visual Studio custom. You know, hey, here's here's how this works, and you can just copy paste it at your your project file and and get that to auto deploy for you when you're doing your dev work if you choose. So it's very flexible. There are extensions that are, are now available for Visual Studio. Um, Personally, I've been burnt too many times on it not uh, keeping up to date Mm because I want to be on the next greatest version of Visual Studio, like when it comes out. And so, you know, I'm kind of geeking out on that. So that's that's something that um, I hold off on. I'm like, okay, there's all these tools that are available out in the out in the wild that are handling this for me in a way that I'm more comfortable with and I'm ready to play with. Um, So I'm not quite on that bandwagon quite yet, but it's mostly because I have also the experience of not being of being able to do that outside the, the Visual Studio that I haven't dived into that, if that yeah. makes sense. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, abilities that are in it. And, and yeah, it's you're building DLLs at the end of the day mm-hmm. for your, your server-side stuff and the client-side stuff, do whatever, you know, your VS Code, whatever you want to use. I, I personally use VS Code for my client stuff and Visual Studio for my, my um, back-end plugin stuff because nice. I tend to think those are the best tools. But it doesn't mean you have to do that. You can do whatever you want. It's all, it's all the same Microsoft technologies in the back-end. So it, you're really not, having to abandon anything. Um, you know, if you're, <laughs> I guess if you're thinking about doing the um, portals, uh, you know, they might get locked into some version of the the portals um, uh, technology in that sense. But that's, again, UI stuff that you don't have to deal with at all um, and isn't a part of the core dataverse. It's the portals, like yeah. kind of um, add-on product for that. So yes, so that would, would be uh, on those, along those lines. So. Nice. I've, I've hammered you with a, a, quite a few questions, probably the most questions I've ever asked on a podcast, actually. And But is there anything I missed? That if you, you know, the audience are, you know, .NET developers, what do you say to them? Anything I missed? Anything we haven't discussed today? So I had one developer that I was tutoring at a company, and we were like, uh, a week into, you know, kind of working together on something. 
And he's like, right, I'm, I'm putting my two weeks notice. I'm like, what, what are you leaving? I thought you were doing great. He's like, I was, I was starting to like it too much. It was scaring me. I, I was like, no, I guess, guess if I like it, I, I may never, never, may never leave it. And so, uh, and so that was why he left, which I thought was kind of an interesting reason to do that. But, um, you know, for someone that's a developer that's being concerned about joining or concerned about, you know, getting the skills to do that, um, you're scared for the unknown and that's understandable, but that shouldn't be a reason to not, to not uh, push it. The Level Up Discord channel has got hundreds of developers on there and Microsoft is on there as well that you can ask questions on and get answers on almost 24 hours a day. Yeah. And so you've got help, you've got support. AI knows everything. Like you can have it write you a basic plugin because it's out there already. It's not mm-hmm. custom. It's not, it, it's the people have already solved half those problems. Um, the problems that you do have, pe- people usually solve that nine times out of 10. Hey, I, this is annoying. I don't want to do this again. Oh, okay. Well, someone's already solved this. Great. I will take what they have and utilize it and move on. So um, there's so many things that you may have to deal with or learn as a custom person that you don't have to worry about. Um, and then you've also got this natural upgrade path as the platform keeps on growing. You just get to keep on growing with it. Um, so from a, a dev perspective, that's great. From a company perspective, you're hedging your bets as well because if you are building on the platform versus custom, if you, you lose, let's say you have a developer lunch, everyone goes out and has a lunch and they get hit by the proverbial bus. Who's going to be able to take over for that? Who's going to be able to learn everything that you had? It's going to be very, very difficult. But if you're on a power platform sort of thing and that happens, you can go and get 10 guys today. You may not be the best guys, but you can get 10 guys a day. And if you wait a month or a couple months, you get 10 really good guys, um, guys and girls. I wasn't using that as a, as a gender thing, but just as you know, people to go through and do this and be up and running and not be missing, not be in this horrible, unrecoverable state where you may not have a way forward. Um, and so just from a risk perspective, I, I think that's something that should be talked about. On top of, it's so much cheaper uh, as far as how quick it is to get something developed and how few developers you need because you've already brought everything already in. And usually it's the sucky stuff that you don't want to deal with as a developer. I don't want to deal with security. And when I was doing custom dev, it was like, all right, I'm going to spend 20 minutes to do this and, and I can get it done. And I spent two hours figuring out the security and then 20 minutes actually doing the work. And I was like, well, if I just didn't have to worry about the security, it would be done simple. Well, here, it's done for you for the most part. So um, all those reasons are great reasons to to um, take the leap and to give it a shot. And uh, yeah, and if you're doing that, reach out and let me know. And uh, I'd love to connect with you and show you some tools that you probably um, will save you hours if you just know that they exist. Like, hey, unit testing, use this. Hey, you want to be able to run SQL queries, use this. Um, hey, you want to do this, then use this. Hey, you want early bound typings, then use this. And um Hey, you want some tracing? Hey, go use this. There's all these tools that are out there that um, are, and that's the reason that I had the XM Toolcast because I get to learn those tools as well because they're constantly coming out new tools all the time. So um, yeah, so all this stuff, exciting, uh, it's growing, and uh, it will continue being that for the foreseeable future. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.